Ron Rivera joining us. It's Waddle and Sylvie on ESPN 1000. And another reason why we wanted to talk to you is Eric Washington. Eric Washington yeah. is a former uh, defensive line coach here, obviously, in Chicago. He has worked under you for many years. What are the Bears getting in their new D.C.? Well, first and foremost, you're getting probably one of the better defensive line coaches throughout the entire league. He really is one of the really good ones. Look at what he's helped do in Buffalo with that pass rush. You know, he's helped train some of the really good pass rushers in this league. Uh, he did a terrific job for us when we were in uh, when we were in Carolina. Uh, we had we had we had one of the top pass rushing uh, groups in, in in the league. I mean, he's he really is very very good at the pass rush and. You know, I think it's brilliant what, 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 what they did in bringing him in there and, and, and helping uh, add him to the defensive staff as the coordinator. I think it's, it, it, it's a smart, very smart move. The pass rushes they have, you know, Montez Sweat, uh, you know, who you guys got from us in a big trade, um, that's going to be a good that, – that's going to be even, even, an even much more dynamic player for everybody. Tell us about the dynamic that exists between being the head coach and, and also the active play caller. Because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, Eric will be the D.C., but I think that Matt Eberflus has said he's going to continue to call defenses. Well, I think that that would be a, a really good thing because a guy like Eric can really focus in on helping to put the game plan together, implementing the game plan, but also he can stick to his expertise as well, and that is making sure the pass rush is very, very consistent throughout the entire game and not, not trying to focus on the entire defense and calling the plays. Hmm. What, so you mentioned Sweat. Take us mm -hmm. inside your building when, when the trade deadline was coming up and, and the push and pull over trading Sweat. Well, the biggest thing more than anything else is, 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 is there was a paradigm switch in, 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 in the way the team was going to be built. Okay, when I was there originally with, with, with Dan Snyder, it was, hey, we can build, we want to build this, you know, this defense, the defense first. Now I think when you look at what they're doing, and I don't want to speak for them, but it, it's a very apparent now it's about building the offense, finding that quarterback, and making sure to put all kinds of, 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 of playmakers around that quarterback. That's kind of what it looks like to me. So does it make sense? Yes. If that's, if that's going to be the commitment and how they want to put it together, then what they did was, you know, find the value, saw what they saw in, 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 in Montez's value, and, and made the decision to go with it. Does he still have room to grow in your estimation, oh, yeah. Ronnie? Yes, yes, I really truly believe that. I think he's going to, I mean, I think he's just scratching the surface of who he is. I mean, you know, he's a guy that's about as dynamic a pass rusher as there is. He's a guy that's got the kind of a ability to, uh, to, to impact a game. He makes the guys around him better. And, and, and again, watching a couple of your guys' games um, at that near the end of the season, just watching him play, you could see how the guys around him benefited from this guy's ability to get vertical as a pass rusher, force the quarterback to step up, force them to, 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 to chip him or double him on his way up the field. So, so guys are now getting more one-on-one -on -one treatments. Hey, Ron, speaking of dynamic play, can you walk us through like trying to, to game plan for a player like Justin Fields, who you faced in each of the last oh. two years and how difficult it is and, and just what what is your plan of attack with regard to trying to contain a dual threat quarterback? Well, see, and that's exactly it. it it's it's is a dual threat quarterback is about as dangerous as it gets. The hard part for the dual threat quarterbacks is staying healthy now. Um, you know, because it, it seems to me that you don't see as much of the protection for those guys as you do for a true drop back guy. Because, again, the dual threat guy, he brings it upon himself because once he tucks that football, once he starts to move in that pocket and, and he looks like he's a runner, now all bets are off. He can get hit and take those, have to take those big shots. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that, that, in my opinion, with these dual threats, you see it starting to wear on these young players. You know, um, Again, Justin's missed a couple of games because of it. What happened uh, to, to the kid up in um, Richardson up in Indianapolis this year, getting hurt his rookie year. You know, so that's that's a whole different set of dynamics that you now have to account for as far as those kind of guys. What we tried to do anytime we had to face that was, you know, we had to have different sets of rules for the RPO action. We had to have different sets of rules for um, for the zone reads and how we were going to play those. We were going to play what we called we had mesh attacks. We had what we called a rope technique. I mean, those those quarterbacks demand so much more of your work 
you know, during the practice week. And, and, and then if they don't do those things, you've wasted your time preparing for it. Then all of a sudden you got a guy going hard play action, dropping back and, you know, and reading your coverages and then and, and hitting, you know, hitting number 12 up the seam on us for a touchdown. I mean, th- th- those are things that you, you don't necessarily always prepare for, and all of a sudden he's doing because he's not running the ball this much, as much this week, and, and that's what the game plan called for. I mean, now I'm just reflecting on what happened in our game, but, you know, we had prepared for a lot of the RPO. We prepared for a lot of the quarterback runs, and then the next thing you know, he's going, you know, you guys are running the football, then coming play action off of it, and, you know, got us off balance a little bit and, and made a couple big explosives with, uh, you know, with, with uh, D.J. Moore. Ron Rivera joining us. It's Waddle and Sylvie on ESPN 1000. That was one of his best games. Did you see an improved thrower in that game? I did. I saw a guy that anticipated very well and put the ball out where it needed to be run, uh, thrown to give their, his receiver the chance to run and get him. You know, he, he did some really good things, really dynamic things that show what he's capable of. And, you know, I think, you know, they're in a very interesting position holding the number one pick in the draft. I mean, you know, again, it's it's, it's a great spot to be in, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a couple of big decisions they're going to have to make. When, like, do you have a lean one way or another? Oh, I, I uh, you know, it, it, it's tough because I think the, the, the quarterback group that's coming out this year is, is one of the better ones in the last few years. So, you know, you got to really study them and look at them and look at what the impact is, um, and then you got to make your decision on what you want to do with them. How difficult, Ron, from your perspective, do you think it is for a quarterback? Like, if they move forward with Justin, and let's just speak hypothetically, mm-hmm. he'll be learning his third offense in four years. It's yep. not probably the, the the most horrible thing to have to do, but if you're trying to speak a third language in four years in some ways, how hard is that for the player? It, it is very difficult, but the biggest thing is, is you know, and, and what we, you know, what I've always kind of believed is that you got to, find out the concepts what concepts does he know what concepts does he do best and you know what relates to that concept that he likes you know it's it, like like there's different types of high lows how you can how you can attack a defense using a high low combination whether you're high lowing the corner whether you're high lowing through the middle of the of, of the defense you know now all of a sudden is hey yeah we used to call that a spin dig oh yeah well you know we, we you know we, we called it this and okay so so just know that whenever, whenever you know, we call high-low, we call spin-dig, you're thinking the high-low combination. Okay, I get that concept. Well, well, who are we trying to do it off? We're trying to do it off the Mike Lambert. We're trying to do it off of the corner. Oh, we're trying to do it as uh, on the roll-down safety. So, again, just learning those concepts and understanding, you know, how am I supposed to read it? What is my progression? Well, if, if it's something he's already done, if you can get it so that it relates to him, you know he'll learn very quickly, and 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 I I you know and I I'll tell you just watching Justin play, I think Justin will be able to handle. It. I really do. I think he's a, a dynamic young player that you know given the opportunity just may grow into it. But again, like I said, they're in a really interesting position having the the number one pick. Being in D.C., did you ever um, cross paths with Caleb Williams? No, no, unfortunately not. You know, he was um, by the time we got there, I, I believe he is. He was getting ready to go away to college, and it was uh, the, the you know for two years we had to deal with the uh, the COVID outbreak. Hey, Ronnie, you, you you've been a head coach in this league for thirteen straight years. Um, your name's been linked to some teams potentially. I know that there's an interview here and there's interest over here. What do you want to do? Do you want to stay? you know, involved in the NFL this year, or do you want to take a year off? What are your plans? You know, it's interesting because, you know, I don't have to make a decision right away. You know, I've talked with, with, with a couple of teams, you know, I've, I've, I've talked with people in, in the media, you know, I've, 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 I've mentioned some stuff to the league. So we'll see. I have to, I really do. It's kind of funny that, that <laughs> it, it, it's kind of almost what's out there and what's coming to me. So, to be honest with you, I'm out in California right now. My wife and I are just enjoying the, the, the sunshine and a little bit of golf and uh, hanging out at the beach. It's, it's a nice a, change yeah, of pace, right. isn't it? Yeah. Like so, sometimes just yeah. getting away from it all is, is, is the best solution. It really is because, to be honest with you, you know, I watched the games yesterday, and it's funny. It's like no stress. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it is a little different after 14 seasons. But, you know, again, like I said, I've got time. I've got an opportunity to look at things. You know, and, and no matter what I do, I, I, I'm, you know, it's going to be 
you know, it's going to be around football. You know, it, it's what, what, from what perspective, you know, whether I'm in the middle of it or if I'm outside looking in, um, it will be around football. What about Harbaugh? You know, uh, Waddle still reminisces about <laughs> the day. He, well, you, tell me why you're laughing. Just because you, as soon as you said Harbaugh, I can think of anybody to tell you about it. Waddle can tell you, uh, Tommy can tell you about, uh, about Jim. None of us are surprised, are we, Ron, that he, no. he, like, he's not, A, not only that he's coaching, but he's been wildly successful. Yeah. Oh, not, not, without a doubt. I mean, the thing that's very interesting for him is, you know, going into San Diego, or San Diego, golly, that shows how old I am, going <laughs> into the Chargers right. situation, you, you couldn't, in my opinion, you couldn't go into to a better one because this is a quarterback league now. This really is. More so than any other time, of, of, of professional football, this is about the quarterback. You have a quarterback to start off from day one. You are in a great situation. You are ahead of over half the teams in the league, okay, especially the dynamic one they have in Justin Herbert. I mean, that was the job everybody that was out there wanted. Now, you've got the quarterback. You've got a pretty stout, nasty defense, you know, that's got pass rushers that are hard to come by. You've got good people through the middle of it. You know, so so you're 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 in a good spot defensively. They've got some really good playmakers around them, and they've got some they they've got some pretty good offensive line talent up there too. So I think Jim Harbaugh has come into a cherry of a, of a, of a uh, situation. I think he can have success early on and continue to build it. I mean, you know, they they're going to be patient. They have time, but he can do it. And in his style and his way, if these guys buy into him right off the bat from day one. They're going to be wildly successful. We've seen the success he's had um, when he's had to start from scratch. He's not starting from scratch this time. He's, he's starting in a very good situation instead of circumstances. Ron, uh, we are both cancer survivors as well. And um, oh. after, yeah, and we, we, like, we had it nearly at the same time. Um, how is your health doing? And how, how are you different, if at all, uh, post-cancer? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I will say this. Um, health is very good. I've been very fortunate. I, I just had my, my, my third-year scans. They were all negative, which is a good thing. Um, I just had a, a complete physical, and, and everything came out fine as well. So, you know, right now it's just, it's just again, I, I, you know, you, you want to get to that five-year, you know, and, and, and be cancer-free after five years, and then pretty much, you know, it's life is normal. So uh, other than that, you know, the, the biggest change to me is my perspective, the way I look at things, you know. I think I've, I've, I've developed more patience. I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I, I try to not sweat little things as much as I, I, I do um, like I used to. So there's, there, are some, there are some emotional changes, stuff like that. Just get a big, bigger appreciation for stuff. So that's why, to me, it, it's, it's kind of refreshing to be in the situation I am where I don't have to hurry through anything. I can take my time. I can make a good decision. And then see what happens this year. You know, if, if I coach, great. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be fired up. I promise you that. If um, if I don't coach, that's great because then I'll be I'll have a chance to look at it from outside in and think about what do I want to do next season. See see if there's something there for me to do. Is there a tough transition that would exist? Do, would you anticipate, Ronnie, if you went from being a head coach to a DC? Oh no, no. That trust me, football is football. But the biggest thing, you know, Tommy, that I did the last four seasons or three and a half seasons for the most part was I managed, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I managed, I didn't coach. I managed a lot of little things that came up, a lot of stuff that I had to make decisions on. Some of the decisions I made weren't even involving football. Uh, You know, it was around football, but it wasn't directly football on the football field or on the football team. Those things, you know, when, 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 when you have to take from, you know, what's going on in the X's and O's, that's, management you know what i'm saying that 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 to me wasn't wasn't fun and you know when when the middle of the season you know i made a decision to move on from 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 our defensive coordinator and i became the, the primary defensive play caller you know the the biggest thing i found was was the connection i had getting back into the middle of things getting directly involved with it all over again was it was was a hoot i really enjoyed the heck out of it i had a lot of fun and it was one of those things that you know, it was, it was, wow, this is all right. I get it. This, this is what it's like again to get, you know, to interact with the players and to, you know, to be there and touching things again, like, 
you know, now it was it was a different set of circumstances as opposed to what I was dealing with as the manager. Yeah. Put your analyst <laughs> hat on, Ronnie. Tell us what what did you see yesterday? Analyze those two championship games for us. Well, I'll tell you what. If you look at what happened with uh, with uh, Kansas City and uh, and Baltimore. The biggest thing, more so than anything else, was uh, Baltimore really was very very inconsistent offensively. Uh, they struggled to, to to keep any momentum going. Uh, every time they had an opportunity, uh, unfortunately, they were forced to turn the ball over. Uh, a lot of credit to what Steve Spagnola did with that defense for Kansas City. It was very impressive in terms of just the way he mixed it up, the way he brought pressures. He, he ran zone pressures. He ran man pressures, which kind of kept uh, the quarterback off balance and didn't let Lamar Jackson get comfortable back there. Uh, constantly pressured him, forced him to move in the pocket and didn't allow him to set his feet. Or when he started to scramble, uh, you know, he wasn't as effective as he typically was for the most part because of the way they, uh, they spied him. Anytime uh, the, the protection started to break down, the quarterback, you know, he tried to pull the ball down. There seemed to be somebody always in, the, in, in his way that didn't allow him to get going as far as running the ball like he typically does. So hats off to what they did as far as uh, Kansas City's defense. And, uh, you know, I think that was really the big difference in the game. What about Dan Campbell in the Lions game? I thought, like, you were the perfect guy to talk to because, you know, several years ago you got the nickname mm-hmm. – uh, riverboat Ron and you embrace that a lot mm-hmm. of times you would go for it and 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 it would really help the team uh mm-hmm. get get behind everything so Dan Campbell it, it's how he how he's built the team but now because yep. it didn't work uh, a lot of people are taking shots he should have settled for three someone okay. like you who's been the head coach yep. when you hear the criticism what do you say well this is the funny thing uh, because I do believe analytics basically said that he should yep. kick the field goal and instead of going for it, you know what I'm saying? And so it's, it's, it's one of those funny things that one minute everybody wants to quote analytics and the next minute nobody wants to quote analytics and they want to take shots at people. Trust me, it's what he, the decisions he made were very difficult decisions to make. He made them be, the way he did, in my opinion, because he was sticking true to who he is and who his football team is, the way they, he built them. Okay, and if, if it had been successful, everybody would have lauded him. Everybody would have loved him. It's exactly what happened with Sean Payton when he kicked the onside kick in the Super Bowl against uh, against Peyton Manning. Remember that? And everybody said, "Oh my God, that's fantastic! That's great! What a great move!" Now, what if it hadn't worked? <laughs> okay, so again, I mean, it's so easy to take those pot shots. I think Dan Campbell just stuck true to who he is, and kudos to him for doing that. He believes in his guys. That's why he did it. He's believed in them since he's got there. Okay, they suffered through a very difficult season their first year, their second year. You know, they were they were they were average. Okay, but they were there was something there and he knew it. I went through the same thing. My first three years was the same exact situation, except we didn't get to the NFC championship game. But my first three years, if if my owner hadn't hadn't, you know, believed in me enough to keep me there and I hadn't believed in our guys to start going for it on fourth downs, we wouldn't have had the we wouldn't have the run that we had. So I think everybody if unless you've been there, don't draw me a map. You know, <laughs> it's just one of my favorite things because, you great. know, people are always yeah. telling me what to do. And it's like, well, nobody's ever done what we do. There's only 32 of those jobs. And when a guy like Dan Campbell does what he does and has the success he's, he has, he should be applauded for it. Ron, take us inside the decision making. When you're standing on the sideline in that short time and you mentioned analytics, mm-hmm. you've got yeah. the headset on. So, mm-hmm. like, who are you talking to and how much of the decision is based on the analytic numbers, the numbers and the math about the percentages and what you feel in your gut, uh, we just need to go for it based yep. on your feel of the game. You know, it's funny. I mean, I could sit here and say, you know, it, 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 you know it, it's all based on my gut, right? It's all based on analytics. And it's funny because there's been a couple of times when I've gone for it um, and I've thought to myself, you know, the only reason I think I'm going for it is because I've heard the percentages. Okay, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's funny because when the analytics say go for it and you go for it, you don't get it, everybody says, hey, that's all right. That's what the number said. But it's not really all right because, again, just because it says, hey, you're going you're gonna to convert eight out of ten times, what's that one happen? What happens if you're just those two times when you don't? You know what I'm saying? It's okay because you did what the number said, you went with the percentages, or because of your gut feeling because you know that your way your defense is playing, the way your defense is shut people down. 
you know, that you're willing to do it. I, I can tell you right now, I've done that because our defense was playing really well against their offense, and I just knew we could hold them. That's why we did what we did. Or, you know what, the reason I kicked it was because I didn't have the confidence that we could stop them. Uh, again, real quick, so, uh, so, so I just thought we'd take the points right now and then see what happens. That's you know why, I mean? yeah, Ronnie, that's why I watched the game, and I was like, look, I, I, Dan Campbell knows his team better than I know his yep. team. Dan Campbell knows that he's got an explosive offense and a defense that is bottom five in pass defense. Yep. I'm yep. facing the 49ers, so, I mean, I'd rather, if I have an opportunity, rely on my offense to, to convert versus to rely on my defense to stop a really good offense. Does that play yeah. into the rationale as well? Absolutely. That's exactly the way he thinks about it. And he understands his guys better than anybody. And again, he's the guy that showed everybody that you got to believe, you got to trust, you got to be willing to put it out there. And that's what he's always done. So kudos to Coach for, for sticking to who he believes uh, his team is. How many times, Ron, does a, a decision that's made, whether it's a good decision and one of your players screws up and makes it look bad, and how many times – does a player save your ass by making a great play when you made a bad call? Absolutely. That's all part of it, too. And, 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 and nothing ever tells you what the weather's going to be like during the game. You know what I'm saying? So, so, those, so when the analyst comes up, it doesn't know whether it's raining, it's snowing. Okay? The analyst doesn't know who's hurt, who's not hurt. All right? So, again, you've got to make decisions based on what you think is best for your organization at that point in time. You know, you do it based on your gut, based on your feel. And if somebody gives you a number or two that says, hey, look, you know, just so you know, it is in our favor here to do that. Maybe that just helps, you know, reinforce what you're doing and gives you even more confidence to go out and do it. So, so again, it's, you just got to understand the flow of the game. You know, and, and back in, you know, in, 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 in 2013 when I started doing that, what had happened was I had gotten some great advice from John Madden who said to me, he said, Ron, go with your gut instinct. Go with your feel. Go with your experience. You have played enough football. You have coached enough football to know better than anybody else what your team can and can't do. That's a great story. Uh, you re you remember Cap, right? You know, Cap's yeah. always got a hot take. How could you not? Yeah. How could you forget Cap? He, Cap's got a <laughs> – he, he just had a rant about analytics the other day. He hates yeah. the going for two when you're down 14. Yep. What yep. do you what do you think about this that has become commonplace in the NFL right now? Well, it's not, and it's, honestly, it's not necessarily commonplace in the NFL because some people do look at it this way: if you go, if you score a touchdown, you got all this momentum, you just grind one out, you score a touchdown, and then you go for two and you get stopped. Now what happens? Now you've just taken away the momentum you just created. It might work on the reverse. You know what I'm saying? The answer is, well, if you go for two and you don't get it, well, then you can score again and then you can go for two again. Okay? Well, if it's hard to go for two and, and, and convert once, is it going to be hard to convert again? You know what I'm saying? Or, or the analyst saying, what's well, a 50-50 proposition? <laughs> well, right. what if it's 50-50 if you get to try it four times? Then you know you go 0 for two the first two, and then you go for two for two the next uh, two for four the next time. So now you're 50-50. See what I'm saying? So yeah. there, there's nothing tells you whether you're going to do it for sure or not. You just have to be willing to try. Uh, Ron, as we're talking big picture NFL issues right now, I'd love to get your take on the officiating. We, we I think, maybe we complain about it too much as viewers of the game, but for somebody right. who's in the middle of it, I'd like to know, A, do you think that it is adequate? And if not, how does the league get better at the overall officiating of a game that that we all admit is very hard to officiate because there are mm -hmm. so many great yep. athletes moving at a high rate of speed. Yep. And that's exactly it. And in my opinion, you got to add some more eyes. I, I, that's the one thing I believe that could help the, the officiating. I know it's expensive to do it. I know that's what everybody's concerned about, the added expense. But if you added a couple more sets of eyes, you could really, truly do a really good job, in my opinion. You know, like you've only got two guys in the, in the, in the offensive backfield, and you've got, you've got three guys in the uh, uh, defensive backfield, all right, and you've got two, line, two guys on the sidelines. So if you added 
a couple more sets of eyes, I think you could be even better as far as the refereeing is concerned. You know, because I, I do agree, it is a very difficult job. It's, it's, it, it, things are happening real fast at real time, and it's tough to catch everything. That's why a couple sets of eyes is something that you have to have. I mean, with, with, with everything that's going on in the league, with, with gambling now yes. playing a big part of it, because we see it every week, the integrity of what's going on during the action of a game is so important to so many people now for, for whatever the reason is, we have to make sure we get it right. And that's what the league is trying to do. Now, consistency is probably the biggest thing that's going on right now that needs to happen. Is, is If you're going to call them, call them. If you're not going to call them, don't call them. But you have to be consistent. It's got to go out through the entire game to say at least the refereeing was consistent. That's a huge plus. Would you be an advocate, Ron, of, of, of expanded use of instant replay? Uh, let's just say, let's say specifically for for roughing the quarterback. Oh, yeah. For, for, uh, there, there's a couple things that there have to be, but you have to limit the amount of usage because if you did, those games would be four-and-a-half, five-hour <laughs> games. You know, so, so to me, again, certain penalties are going to be called roughing the quarterback. Helmet-to-helmet contact. Stuff like that I think would be very important to have. Ron, it was great to catch up. Yes. All the best and uh, continued great health, okay? Thank you, Ronnie. Right. Pre- appreciate it, guys. Y'all take care.